All right, so I got one slot today and one slot on Wednesday. There's a little bit of overlap in between them, and so I tried to put anything that was really talking specifically about compilers today. Um, what you'll see, it's informed by standardization stuff, and for everything else, we'll continue on, um, on Wednesday. And so basically, I have some set of slides that's for today, and then slides after that are for Wednesday. Okay. So I'm talking about cross-platform, and by that, um, there's many different compilers, so I'm not talking specifically about LLVM or GCC, I'm talking about compilers in general. Yes, it applies to GCC, yes, it applies to LLVM, and it applies to any other backend that might be out there, right? So if somebody's writing a, a Rust compiler and not generating like LLVM IR or you're trying to use GCC as a backend or something like that, um, the point is these are generic issues that will apply to any compiler backend. Perhaps even front end, maybe. Um, depending, and we're going to go through these. And there's also multiple runtimes out there, right? Obviously, there's a Linux kernel, there's eBPF for Windows, there's various user mode um, uh, runtimes, such as like, even in the Linux user mode. Um, then there's various offload cards, whether it's Netronome or other vendors. And so all these are environments that run uh, BPF, or that we want to run BPF more and more in the future. And they're a little bit different. They're not all ubiqu they're not all have exactly the same capabilities. And so this presentation is about the goal of saying, can we use the same compiler with any, maybe asterisk, any, any compliant, maybe is probably a better way to phrase it, any BPF compliant runtime? What does that mean? How do I build a compiler that can work with any BPF compliant runtime? And of course, the compliant word is informed by the IETF standardization discussion, and that's where the overlap is between the, this presentation and the one on Wednesday that's about uh, process and open issues and things. So. All right, so that's the context of this presentation. So what do we mean by compliant? Okay. So first I'm gonna report out by what the BPF working group has defined as the way to, to talk about compliance to the ISA. Okay. So the document, which is in IETF's last call, which means it's almost RFC right now, and we think all the technical issues are worked out, and there's maybe some editorial issues to clean up as, as things are kind of trickling in. Um, and so technically it defines a concept that's called conformance groups. These are logical units of functionality. And so a runtime has to claim compliance to a set of one or more conformance groups. The one that's called base32, you can't not do that one, right? So the absolute minimum set is you could say, I'm a compliant only base32. Your runtime can then say, I want to support you know, any of these other ones, right? Do I support 64-bit operations or only 32 in that, in that uh, offload card, right? We've heard that offload cards, many of them want to say, I only want to support 32-bit BPF, okay? So how do I deal with that? What if I don't want to support uh, division, modulo, and multiplication, okay? So all these things you can think of across each runtime, you have a different set of variations, but it's a finite set. It's these are the levels of granularity that you can claim conformance to. You can't say, I'm gonna support division but not multiplication or something like that. It doesn't make sense, right? It says this is the minimal set, and as a runtime you say, I'm conformant to, say, base 64, which means I inherently also support base 32 without having to say it, right? That's what the includes column means, right? You can't support base 64 without supporting base 32, but you can do the other way around, okay? So it's like the language for declaring what you're compliant to, okay? Um, the status on the right side, historical means things that um, if you're doing a brand new runtime, you might say, I'm not going to do these to begin with, right? So like legacy packet instructions, if you're developing a new runtime or a new offload card, you might say, I'm just gonna skip that all together because nobody needs to be asking for that, okay? So I have to be able to be aware of that when doing my compiler or other tooling. Same thing, by the way, applies to verifiers and so on, okay? So that's what, that's what the different columns and stuff. So this is a table basically directly out of the spec as it exists now. And all this was discussed on the list before, but I'm trying to get us all on the same page because you'll see where I'm going with the uh, support and compilers or the, how you would deal with this sort of thing. I'm gonna walk through an example going forward just to just kind of see how this works. So let's say going forward, we said we want to add some other instructions to the ISA. And so this one's, again, taking examples, these are the same slides that I used at IETF for, for the next three slides here, right? Um, so if you were watching that presentation, you've already seen this part and you can wake up in about three slides, so. All right, so here, let's say existing today, we have something that I'm just gonna call, you know, example. It's any of the ones on the previous slide, for example. And you wanna add a new instruction that looks a lot like those and we just didn't do it before, okay? So what happens, right? And so let's say the existing set has two example instructions in it, A and B, and that's what things look like now. And the next version, you know, the next kernel version comes out and we wanna add another instruction or two, okay? So what happens here 
And so we want to add instructions C and D, right, to this set. But what we can't do is we can't modify the existing set. The existing set has that name, and anything that's conformant to that is conformant to that, and so you can't modify that because that would make the other ones non-conformant, okay? So what do you do? You can define another name. In this case, I just arbitrarily used example v2. It's just a string, right? There's nothing magic about that syntax, right? And example v2 is the label on the new instructions. So the new instructions are an in example v2. And they includes column, I say, the only way to claim compliance to example v2 is to also inherit all the compliance of example, okay? So in this sense, you can just say, I had, I, I'm compliant to example v2, and it means I'm compliant to all four of those. So it's a new simple way to just add stuff. It just means you're bumping some version or label change on the thing that you're claiming compliance to. Let's say you want to deprecate one. Uh, just like we're talking about, we want to deprecate the legacy packet instructions. Let's say we figured out we did something wrong. Maybe this never happens, but we have to have this process for it now, right? And so, especially since we actually have a set that we're trying to deprecate now, it says, well, it could happen again, maybe. Uh, and so in this case, let's say we've got four instructions, A, B, C, and D, that's in the example group, and we decide that C and D we did wrong, and we need to replace those with maybe E and F or something like that. So how do we get rid of C and D from a compliance statement perspective? So again, we can't change example. Anything that's compliant to example is still compliant to example in A, B, C, and D. But what we can do is we can define another one that's example v2. Well, the meaning of example v2 here is everything but C and D, right? So we label C and D with this label legacy example, and we define example v2 as everything in example minus what's labeled legacy example. So this is great if you have a large number of things in example and you're only deprecating one, it means you don't have to make hardly any changes in the table down here, right? It's, it's, it's simple to understand, it's all but, right? And so these two uh, constructs allow us to say at an implementation level, we're still back to all we're doing is we're claiming compliance to the correct set of strings when you're saying what does this runtime support as this set of strings. Uh, and of course that minimal set of strings will inherit other ones, right? They say example v2 and that means I can figure out that means they have to pass all the example tests minus the legacy example tests, okay? So what does this mean? for runtimes and compilers. Well, I've kind of talked about runtimes a little bit. So a runtime is responsible for stating what conformance groups it's compliant to. So for example, for Linux, that's basically all of them. And so the minimal way to express that right now is uh, that set, Base64, Atomic64, DivMol64, and Packet. Because none of those inherently include or imply the other ones, right? So that's basically the complete set, right? Because things like base32, you don't have to list, right? It's implied by base64, right? That's the minimal set you have to say. And from that, you say, I'm compliant to the entire ISA, okay? Other runtimes might have a different list, okay? The reason, the whole arguments for having the specific set of conformance groups on that first slide is because we know of arguments from runtimes that don't want to have the complete set, right? I only want to support 32-bit operations, or gosh, division is so hard for my offload card and I don't have a case where it would need it, that type of thing, okay? Um, so what that means is that um, after each runtime is responsible for documenting, that means a compiler has to make use of what's the set of instructions by virtue of what's the set of conformance groups that's the only legal set that's going to run on that, on that operating system, if you're using that term, that architecture, that runtime, I'm just using the ter generic term runtime in this presentation, whether you call it an operating system or not, right? What's in your offload card? I don't care what term you use. It's a runtime, right? So impact on compilers. Here's my thoughts for people that do compiler development, for all of you guys and anybody else out there doing Rust or whatever else, thinking you're gonna design your own backend. So my proposal or my recommendation is that compilers should allow specifying the set of conformance groups. That means if I have a runtime, let's say I'm developing an offload card, I can pick a set of, of uh, conformance groups that I'm gonna support that offload card, and then come to your compiler and I can say, here's the set of conformance groups I support, please generate stuff for me, or perhaps fail the comp compilation, right? To say, sorry, that, that construct is not supported, right? Um, so this notion of using CPU versions is not uh, granular enough to be able to support the use cases that we have today. Right? So I consider the use of CPU versions to be historical. 
Okay. Maybe we'll, it will never go away, maybe, right? But going forward, it's not really where I want to say what's going to be in CPU view version 5. I'm saying that's the wrong terminology. I'm going to say what's the right conformance group to add such that the runtime can say I either support or don't support that. Okay. So it's just a way of naming things rather than the way that we've named things in the past. And this is what the IETF working group has been talking about. Okay. So when talking about how do you specify or how do you, how, how do you, how do you let a user or a runtime or a header file or something express the set of conformance groups that they want to use at a compiler level? And by the way, the same is true if I was going to talk about verifiers or about uh, the conformance testing suite that we'll hear about in a uh, later presentation. Um, you can either do it in an implementation either by a delta-based method or a full-based method. And you might have already thought of one of these when I was talking about it on the previous slide, right? So if you're thinking about a delta base, that means maybe you start from a default list, such as everything that Linux supports, and you allow somebody to turn off and, you know, know whatever or, you know, without the know whatever, okay? So delta based, let's say you have a runtime that supports um, packet plus some future group that doesn't exist, right? We've hypothesized that maybe in the future we'll make some collects once we get consensus on what that means, and so maybe we got some uh, future group that would be in that category. So how would you say I support that too? Well, if I'm delta-based, I might say I support all the mandatory ones, but I also support packet and call X, right? That would be an example of delta-based saying also these, also the two include ones, modify the, the default with that. Or I might have a command line or another way of specifying that says, no, I just want you to specify the complete set. And then you go back to, you know, base 64, div multi and so on, and add the other stuff on at the end, right? Either of those are valid implementations, right? It's still using the same labels. The point is you're using a label, either delta-based or, or uh, full set-based. Example of a runtime that doesn't support atomics, right? You'd say everything but atomics, or you'd say, I support base 64 and div 64, but notice I didn't say anything about atomic 32 or atomic 64. Another example of a runtime that only supports 32 bit instructions, right? I can either exclude all the 64 bit ones because that, those were all assumed as in the default, or I can say there's no default, I'm gonna say that's the new set, okay? So if I'm developing a compiler, I'd probably um, specify, I'd probably first decide, am I going to use a delta-based mechanism or a full-based mechanism, and how am I going to expose that to, to users, right? Is this command line options or something else? And if so, which of these two am I going to use for my command line options, okay? In theory, different compiler developers could take different approaches here, although the more people agree, then, then the easier it is to, to use multiple compilers, so. Okay. That's the part about conformance groups. But the issue with cross-platform um, work on compilers is not limited to just conformance groups. That's only the ISA part, okay? There's more differences than just ISA. Let's talk about the PSABI, right? And the IETF, as we'll say, there, there's not a, the PSABI is not, a, is not listed as being a proposed standard on the list. It's informational, why there could be multiple of them. And in fact, there are multiple of them right now. Um, so as an example, uh, types of things that would be in the PSABI, at least I believe they're in the PSABI. Um, some of them are in a tiny document right now, little snippets of what, one paragraph or something. Other ones are absent right now, and we kind of have this in our heads. We think we know what it should say or some topics that it should cover, even if we don't know what it should say. Here's some of the topics, okay? How many BPF registers are there? The number 11 is not set in stone. It's not defined by the ISA, okay? Some runtime could say, I want to define R11, right? There's four bits, right? I can number registers from 0 to 15. Does somebody want to add some more? No, that's up to the PSABI. Uh, which ones are scratched versus saved across calls? Um, which one is the stack pointer? Is the stack pointer R10? That's not specified in the, in the ISA, right? You could have a, a, a runtime that doesn't do that. It would not conform to the same PSABI as Linux does, right? But you could have one. Um, how large is the stack? Is it 512 or bigger? Okay. Not part of the ISA. How much stack space does a BPF to BPF callee get? Okay, all these things are things that can be verif can can be different across runtimes. We'd like there to be a very well defined set and tell people how to write their PSABI that answers these questions. Um, just an example of where things maybe differ across uh, existing ones that I'm familiar with. Um, when I looked at uh, UBPF, right, at what passes in as the context of like an XTP program, right, um, R2 is the size of the context. Okay. It doesn't just pass, set pass in R1, it passes in R2 as being the size of the, of the buffer that R1 points to. That's something that's very specific to UBPF. I don't know if there's any other runtime that does that. But the point is it's a variation of a, of a, of a PSABI that, that UBPF uses. 
Or perhaps you can argue maybe that's a property of the program type's definition, right? That's the sort of discussion we got to have, right? But the point is, the compiler has to either make a call that says, I'm going to support only one PSA ABI, and here's the answer to these things here. And I'm going to generate code such that, like, R10 is always the stack pointer and so on. Or I have to allow the user to specify which PSA ABI it is, and that's pretty complicated, right? So this is where discussion and feedback happens. So go ahead. Um, of, yeah, I just of, of those points, um, regarding which register is the stack pointer. So BPF, it basically implements this sort of uh, automatic style of allocation. I mean, in the prolog of functions, you don't have to allocate your, your, your stack space. You get a stack pointer um, decrease for you, so to say. Um, so I don't think that can be part of the PSA BI for that reason. I think that, I mean, are you foreseeing that there may be like runtimes that work differently? Um, I can tell you the current state is that uh, the ABI, sorry, the ISA document never uses the word stack, nor does it say that there's anything special about um, R10. The uh, ABI.RST document does. That's the one that says that the ABI.RST document in the repository says that's what R, R, R10 is the read only stack pointer. Okay. Now, you can imagine a runtime that might want to, and, and whether we want to allow this or disallow it is up to part of the open discussion here, but I'm just saying current state, right? Current state in the repository is that somebody could define a different ABI that says R9 is the stack pointer and our registers are numbered 0 through 9 and not 0 through 10. Yeah. And that would be ISA compliant. Is it a good idea is a different question, right? No, no, say, I mean... I can't have enough silicon to have 11 registers, but I could do 8 registers or something like that. That would be legal in the ISA. Yeah, okay. And then you'd have to say, I want to tell you that the stack pointer is now R7 instead, of, and there's only eight registers, zero through seven, instead of 11 registers, zero through 10, and the 10 is the stack pointer. And how do I tell you that? Yeah, but I mean, usually in normal architectures where the stack pointer, the stack pointer is not an ABI artifact, usually, because actually it's something that has consequences in the hardware, in the CPU. Yeah. Like there may be instructions that operate specifically on the stack pointer that operate on some particular register or so on. So. In this case, the BPF hardware, so to say, um, it's giving you the stack pointer that particular register uh, set when a function is called. So I'm not sure, I mean, and it, to me, and I may be wrong, but an ABI is something that you can do differently, but the compiled program does differently. But to me, this sounds more like the stack pointer is also a hardware issue here, right? David, I hand up. I think I see what you're saying, but it feels like a little bit of an arbitrary distinction to point out the stack pointer as something different than other registers. Like, ARM has a certain number of registers that changes what the calling convention can or can't be, right? Like, there's a reason that you have to store x86 uh, extra arguments past six on the stack. So I think, um, <clears throat> like, it just really, do it truly doesn't have to be, like, a hardware-specific thing, right? So, yeah. It depends on the architecture. In some architectures, what the stack pointer is is basically pretty arbitrary. Yeah, it could be considered part of the ABI. But that's, what, that's my point. In the case of BPF, when a function gets called, something, which is not the generated code, is not the caller to the function, something magically sets the value of that particular register. And to me, this doesn't sound like an ABI thing. So what I'm hearing David say, though, is that if you take, say, ARM as an example, right, ARM is a spec that you can claim different types of conformance to that same ARM architecture, right? And different processors might have different variations of, of what's in the ARM spec, right? And this would be an example of the analogy that says um, ARM example would be uh, I either have it at R10 or R7 would be at something that might be allowed in the ARM spec. And just like the, the ISA spec allows that flexibility right now, I'm just, that's the current state. Whether that's a good idea or not, that we can talk about that. But I'm just saying the current state is this is part of the API. OK, but in ARM, you have to set, change your stack pointer, whichever it is, yeah, yeah. to, so when you're to allocate the space right. in the stack. So when you're generating code, you got to know what the stack pointer is because you're generating that, right? Okay, right. I mean, what I'm saying is that when DCC or the compiler generates a function, yep. a BPF for some particular function, it's not the caller that is actually setting the value of the stack pointer. Right. It's something else. Yep. It's the hardware. Okay. It's, I don't know, magical, whatever it is. So that's why, I'm, of, of that list, I'm not sure the stack pointer 
entries, maybe. I don't, I'm not sure that it makes sense. I guess what I would say is that, like, depending on what platform you're on, you could have totally different implementations of a stack pointer as well, right? So, like, you don't need to have, like, I don't think, I don't see, I guess, what we gain at all by having, like, a hard-coded stack pointer register, but, you know. I, th you're, I think all you're saying is just, just not common to not, to include it as part of PSABI. Common, not common or not done at all, maybe is what you're saying. Yeah, okay, and I will not say more about this, but, no, my point is that the ABI is about conventions. But in this case, which one is the stack pointer in BPF is not a convention. It's something that gets forced to you as the compiler in this case, right, by the hardware. <laughs> Sorry, the last time we'll pass it back. I think, I think in BPF we could treat it as a convention, though, because you can, just do, you can do totally different things depending on what the platform wants, right? I mean, you could even, like, like uh, if we're going to work on this, like, BPF-specific stack allocations that I, I think Yang Hong is working on, but it might be somebody else, then, like, depending on what the program is doing, the JIT might have some totally different implementation of the stack, right? So it's, uh, you know, that's how I think of it, at least. So the this great discussion, I don't want to cut it off. It's, somebody else has a comment on this. I was just going to up-level it a little bit here once we're done with this discussion. So all right, anybody else on this one? Because um, the, yeah. the, main, the main point I'm trying to get across is that uh, at the compiler level, we have to admit that there could be multiple ABIs out there, right? Unless the IETF, we come back and say, no, we want it to be proposed standard. There should only be one ABI, and everybody should conform to that, right? Which I don't think is likely, but that, it, assuming that that's not the branch taken, right? Then that means we have to allow for the case of not just variations in conformance groups, but also variations in ABI, okay? And so where conformance groups, we had a bunch, we had what? five different axes, you know, knobs that could be on or off, right? Just like in, uh, Jose, in your slide, we had a bunch of uh, no things for different BPF features, and you had like five things on the list here. We're trying to make the granularity not be at the level of instruction, but at the level of conformance group, okay? And otherwise, it's the same kind of concept, right? But the ABI, we haven't had a discussion of how, what's the level of granularity here? Is it you name the entire ABI and you say it's the Linux ABI or it's the UEPF ABI? Is, 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 that, is it more granular? That discussion hasn't happened yet. Wide open for, 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 uh, for, for future feedback and whatever. Um, not necessarily right now, right? But that is a discussion that has to happen, uh, including in, in the IETF, for us to be able to, 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 to go to the charter and, do, and say what's in there, and I'll get to that on, uh, on Wednesday. But the point is that a compiler, you either have to say, well, my compiler is designed for only one ABI, right? People that actually use R10 as the stack pointer and have exactly 11 registers and 512 bytes of stack space, and oh, wait, what if a future Linux version increases the 512 to 1024 or something like that? And that's a new ABI. How do I deal with that, right? So all those are open discussions here. So I have to say, how do I specify that? What's the granularity? All those are unknowns right now. So my goal is to make you think about it right now because you will need to solve this somehow and at least make a decision. Even it's a, I'm only going to support one, and if you ever want to change it, we'll have to deal with it later. That that's maybe just punting the problem down the road. But yeah. okay. sorry, I just wanted to say that I got confused before. It's not a stack pointer; it's frame pointer, right? Yeah, the, the frame yeah, pointer is. Because the, is I just is, remember. Wait yeah, a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. There is no explicit stack right. pointer. That's right. This, that's this, the point. This, <laughs> Correct. The, so, the, the, what yeah, the ISA okay. spec calls it PC is the one you're talking about. No, as it's opposed the frame to pointer that yeah. is actually that you keep, yeah. and then the stack pointer you don't need because it's automatic allocation, so to say. So still, that doesn't make sense <laughs> <laughs> because there is no stack pointer. But for uh, people, your you know? feedback on the PSA BI as it gets documented will be greatly appreciated. How's that? Um, okay. Um, so I've only got one more slide for today. That's, the point is we have uh, conformance group issues that it says, how do I specify that? And we've got variations in which ABI is it? And then the other one is, uh, I put this in here in case people are looking at these slides to kind of point them back to the discussion we had on Ellen's presentation, um, which just says um, different runtimes can have different verifiers. And so uh, when you're generating, you may have to deal with what's the different verifier things, are there optimizations? And there's really nothing new to talk about here because we've had that discussion, right? But I'm saying that discussion is neither conformance group nor ABI, it's a third thing, right? So there's actually three different problems to deal with when trying to have a compiler that works across multiple different runtimes, okay? And so uh, this is to say that that discussion before is neither the first two slides, it's this category and there are actually three different things and so I don't have anything new to add on this one uh, because we've kind of had that. You can read what's on my slide here, but it's all stuff we've talked about earlier today, so. All right. Uh, 
that was my last slide for this part. Um, the rest is for uh, Wednesday. So any other comments or questions or anything that I did not present that has to do with having a compiler that works with multiple runtimes, right? Because I want Clang and I want GCC and any other runtime to be able to work with you know, people's offload cards. I would love there to be more offload cards in the world, right? I'd love there to be more languages in the world. And so these are just issues that I want people to be thinking about and coordinating between people. So thanks. Just in case anyone's curious, the reason that we chose these conformance groups is after a lot of discussion, and many reasons, because they essentially match what RISC-V does. So, yeah, so the, the idea is if you're implementing some offload, like, it seems like matching RISC-V is probably the lowest risk, no pun intended, um, uh, uh, way to, to deal, go about this without turning vendors off of, off of BPF, but also having a reasonable conformance group set up. Yeah. Yep, thank you, David. All right, thanks. Regarding the, the conformance groups, I, I take it that no two instructions pertaining to dif two different uh, conformance groups can have the same encoding, right? Uh, that is approximately correct. Um, no, approximate. Meaning, assume that the answer is that is correct, that every instruction is in exactly one conformance group, okay? The only exception is where I was showing how do you deprecate one, and then you have a negative conformance group. That's the only case. Okay, so your so legacy example is a negative so, one used so, as a, to exclude. So That's basically, the only case. you can reuse the encoding of a deprecated instruction. When in you say encoding, what do you mean by encoding? Uh, well, if you're talking codes, about the particular tuple. Yeah, the opcodes that that. Uh, um, we haven't actually talked specifically about that. Let's say that we deprecate the legacy packet instructions. Okay, let's say ten years from now, can that you know tuple ever be reused? That's, I think, the question that you're asking, and we haven't actually explicitly answered that question as to whether stuff is reusable. I think in the short term, the answer would be, there's plenty of other space, don't do that. It'll be, if it becomes a problem in the future, we can ask that question. That's my opinion, so. Okay. I, well, I, I don't see a reason to do that, this is, is my personal opinion. I'm not necessarily opposed to it, but you gotta have, how do you make sure that you don't have collisions between a really old implementation and a new implementation that's trying to reuse the same thing? I'd say it's probably bad practice unless you can guarantee that it's no longer used. Yeah. Oh well. But yeah, we can, we can look at, because for example in GCC with the RISC-5 support, they already have a full infrastructure to select this uh, extension, not this extension. Maybe those delta things and so on, so we can reuse that mm -hmm. most likely. Yeah, yeah. so for those remote, uh, David said it should match exactly with the RISC-5. Right. Any other comments? Okay, all right, thanks. <laughs>